Hello and welcome as we look at the small catechism once again. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer. This time we're looking at the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, found on page 258 in Luther's small catechism. And it is, give us this day our daily bread. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Always, we're going to begin with responsive prayer one. So if you turn in your hymnal to page 282, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, we're going to do the morning side uh, today. In your Bible, you want to turn to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16. If you have the Faith Alive Bible, it's on page 92. Uh, if you have another translation or another uh, edition of something, I couldn't tell you what it's on, so go ahead and pause this to give you a chance to find it. But please note that uh, this is only the second book in the Bible, so it should be relatively easy for you to find. So once again, we're going to be looking at page 258 in Luther's Small Catechism. We're going to be looking at page 282 in the Lutheran Service Book for Responsive Prayer 1. And in your Bible, we're going to be looking at page 92 or chapter 16 of Exodus, beginning at the first verse. All right, so hopefully you've taken the opportunity to find all of that. Let's go ahead and begin with responsive prayer one. Holy God, holy and most gracious Father, have mercy and hear us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn now to page 283. Again, we're looking at the morning column. I cry to you, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Now at the bottom of the page, we continue with Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Now turn to page 284, if you will, and we'll conclude at the bottom of page 284. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty, or the Lord, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Sorry about that. I always get that confused when I do morning prayer, so that's why. All right. Now from here, we'll move to Luther's small catechism. Again, if you have one that has the black cover here, it's on page 258, as we're looking at the fourth petition. 
give us this day our daily bread. Now Luther writes, what does this mean? Certainly, or God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. Now, looking at the bottom of page 258 with our central thought, uh, notice it says, take away our daily bread, namely the air that we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the homes that shelter us, the government that protects us, and we die. We are dependent upon all of these things, and they come from God. So why is it that knowing that these things are gifts of God, we tend to take them for granted, right? We ignore the giver, and we focus instead on the gifts. And very often, we like to think that those gifts are due to us, right? So uh, the reason why my crop is good this year is because I worked really hard. And, um, or the reason why I, I uh, made a lot of money in the stock market is because I'm really smart. Uh, the reason why I did good in school is because I'm uh, a really hard working student. And while there is truth to some of those things, greater than that is the fact that our Lord not only provides us with the, uh, the seed, the weather that's necessary, um, the intellect, the um, hardworking attitude, God provides us with all of that, but he also enables us to use them. And then even then, despite our hard work, the Lord provides for us in all kinds of circumstances. So even if our crop fails, our Lord still provides for us uh, through other means, right? Through our neighbors, uh, through other farmers who help us out. Uh, maybe my uh, stock portfolio collapses, and yet there are others who continue to assist me and provide for me. Uh, maybe I have lost my job and I have to live on welfare. It's not the government that's providing for me. It's the Lord himself using the government to provide for my needs until he provides a new job and new home and that sort of thing. So all of these things, we have to remember that everything that we have, everything that is good, um, all these things come to us from God. They're not dependent upon us, but solely upon God. And let's look at a uh, an example of that in Exodus 16. We're going to be looking at Exodus 16 verses 1 to 21. Now, you should be somewhat familiar with this story. If you're not, that's okay, but you should be somewhat familiar with this. This is God's feeding of his people uh, in the wilderness following, or following their escape from Egypt. If you need to pause this and find that, go ahead. But I have it with me, so I'll go ahead and continue. Exodus 16, verses 1 to 21. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month. And they had departed after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they, daily, as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meal to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the, the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. When the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer, according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one eat leave any of it till the morning but they did not listen to moses some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank and moses was angry with them morning by morning they gathered it each as much as he could eat but when the sun grew hot it melted now there's a couple of different things in this by the way as we look at this that are kind of important we talk about this um, miraculous bread of heaven as manna. That's what we tend to call it. And that's because the Hebrew word for what is it is manna. So what we call manna, we're literally calling what is it? This bread from heaven that we call manna, where the name simply means what is it? All right. So if you look back at your catechism on page 258, what was challenging to the Israelites about the way God had provided? Well, notice that God only provides them with enough uh, for each day, right? He doesn't over provide. He doesn't allow them to stockpile manna. In fact, look at the end where Moses says, don't save any of it till the next day. And some people didn't listen, right? They were, they were going to um, kind of stockpile it. <clears throat> and what happened is the Lord caused that to grow worms and to get all stinky and nasty so they couldn't eat it the next day. The Lord was testing his people to see if they trusted in his provision, right? So he literally gave them their daily bread each day, just enough to feed them, to fill their bellies as they needed but not more so that they didn't end up stockpiling it. And then by doing so, forget about the Lord who is providing all of that for them. <clears throat> so looking at our catechism there on page 258 at the bottom, notice that bolded section, as Christians, 
we pray that we might be grateful for everything, however ordinary, that God provides each day for our bodily life. Right? So we recognize that our Lord provides all of this, and so we give thanks to the Lord. We recognize his mercy in providing all of these things. And so we give thanks and we glorify him daily. Otherwise, our focus turns back on ourselves. So what habits and practices can help me to better recognize how God sustains my life each day? Well, I don't know about your household. In my household, we pray before every meal. And that is an important thing. Now, most of us pray a very common prayer, right? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. And let these gifts, notice that, to us be blessed. Amen. We focus uh, on that idea that these are God's gifts to us. Now, Luther actually had a different meal prayer that you can find in your catechism. Let me see if I can point you to it here real quick. All right, if you look in your catechism on page 347, let's see, is that where it is? Hmm. Let me check because it used to be there. <laughs> I'll have to look, but it used to be on page 347 that we would have that there. So Luther would always have his family pray, The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hands and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Lord, bless us and these your gifts, which we are bound to receive from your gracious hand, right? And, and that really, I think, is a much, uh, much um, better prayer in teaching us to focus on what our Lord himself is providing for us. So whichever one you pray uh, for your meals, Go ahead and do that, recognizing that also every day when you get up in the morning and you uh, wash your face, you remember your baptism, as Luther says, we should do that every time you wash your face, you make the sign of the Holy Cross and remember your baptism. But also then we uh, give thanks to our Lord for allowing us to wake up in the morning, uh, looking at the beautiful day our Lord has provided. And you sit down and you see that bowl of cereal or that piece of toast or those eggs that God has provided. You give thanks. Everything that we do um, ought to be uh, done with thanks that God has provided these things for us. So back to page 259 in your catechism. Hey, question 268. What is the focus of this petition? It focuses on recognizing God as the giver of all good things and giving thanks for all his gifts of creation that sustain our bodily life. In other words, we pray for all the gifts mentioned in the first article of the creed. Remember all the way back to our discussion of the first article of the creed, you'll remember that much of what's written there by Luther is what we see here and what is meant by daily bread. Very similar discussion there. So question 269. Why does God provide for the earthly needs of everyone, even apart from prayer? Well, as our loving creator God, God looks after his entire creation and provides for both Christians and non-Christians, for people and for animals. Isn't that interesting? God looks after his Christians and non-Christians because all things are part of God's creation. Even if non-Christians uh, do not acknowledge God, he still acknowledges that they are his creatures and he still cares for them, provides for them. Wouldn't it be interesting if God only provided for the believers? Boy, it'd be easy to tell who's a real Christian and who's not, right? Uh, <laughs> thanks be to God he doesn't do that. But 
it's important for us to recognize that God provides for all of his creation, plants, animals, right? He gives food for them. Uh, his, just think, God even provides for those little mosquitoes that are so annoying, and he does so through you and through animals. Isn't that weird? <laughs> so there's a couple of Bible passages that really illustrate this quite well. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 45, he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So again, we see God providing uh, for believers and non-believers. Acts 14, 16 through 17, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Right? So even though other nations worshipped false gods, God still provided for their needs. He still provided for their welfare. Right? Again, because he loves his creation, he creates things that he might bless them, that he can pour out his goodness on them. Now, Psalm 145, this is what I mentioned regarding uh, Luther's meal prayer. Psalm 145, 15 and 16, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Right? So you see how Luther um, adopts this psalm reading as part of his meal prayer. Now, question 270 at the bottom of the page, what is meant by daily bread? Well, bread, there in quotes, is a biblical way of summarizing all that we need to sustain our lives on earth. So everything that we need to support our lives, food, air, clothing, shelter, all of these things, God provides for us. And so we pray in this petition that he would continue to provide these things for us in his mercy. Now, the next page, 260, on question 271, why do we specify daily bread in this petition? Once again, daily highlights how every moment and every day of our lives depend upon God's provision. We never know what the next day will hold. Uh, maybe we get fired from our job, right? Maybe um, we get some illness, um, maybe school burns down. I don't know. It, all kinds of different things can happen very easily. And our ability to provide for the needs of ourselves and our family um, may seem like it's wiped out. And so we pray that God would provide our daily bread, that he would continue each day to provide for our welfare and needs, knowing that he already will. But again, prayer is not to try and uh, make God do anything. Prayer is not for God's benefit. Prayer is for our benefit. So look here at, um, <clears throat> let's see, Acts 17, verse 28. In him, meaning in God, we live and move and have our being, right? So in God, everything of our lives happens depending on his will and benefit. Look at that next verse, James 4:15. You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. This is always an interesting thing, all right? Tomorrow I'm going to, or this is going to happen. Well, again, we don't know what will happen. So anytime we're going to do anything, we say, if the Lord wills, right? If it's God's will for this to occur, this is what I want to do. If it's Lord's will, uh, this is what um, I'm going to do. These sorts of uh, attitudes help remind us, anytime we say these things, it reminds us that everything that happens, uh, God does for our benefit, but not necessarily according to our will, but according to his will. Question 272 then says, for what then do we pray in this petition? We pray that in humility, right, we humbly 
pray. That A, we would look to God for what we need each day so that we do not worry about the future. So we humbly come before God asking his benevolence and his um, care for us, not arrogantly, not like some of these name it and claim it churches, Lord, I'm going to tell you to do this sort of thing. Uh, God is not there to be at our command. God is not a spiritual ATM. Uh, we humbly ask him the same way we would go um, if we had a king, you know, an earthly king, and we would come before our king and say, um, oh, king or queen, um, would you do this? Can you do this? Right? You would come humbly. So in the same way, we come before the true king, right? The king of the heavens, the king of all creation, the Lord of life. And we humbly ask that he would provide what we need each day so that we don't worry about the future. Now, that's also an important thing because knowing that God will provide for us, need, be, need we be worried about the future? Then? No, right? Because God's going to provide for our needs. Look at Matthew uh, chapter 6, verses 20, or verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They, ne they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Right? So if God's going to provide for the little birds, which, I mean, I love little birds. I love to watch little birds. But if God's going to provide for the little sparrows and the finches and and the swallows, will he not much more provide for you the crown of his creation? Look at 1 Peter 5, and, or 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. All of your worries and struggles and, and uh, concerns about the future, Peter tells us to Throw them all on God, knowing that he will care for them in his own way. Look at that note there in Exodus 16, verses 17 to 26. The people of Israel received manna daily and a double portion the day before the Sabbath. Of course, the Lord had established the Sabbath while they were still in Egypt. Right On the seventh day, you shall rest. You not, shall not work. So what does he do? He provides double on the sixth day so that they don't need to go out and try and collect on the seventh day, that they can have that day of rest and already have that food provided for them, right? Which is always an important thing, um, <laughs> especially those who don't take a lot of time off. And I'm looking at a lot of us pastors uh, who tend to work seven days a week. Uh, maybe we need to focus more on trusting that God will get all those things done, uh, whether, whether we do them or not. <laughs> Look at letter B at the bottom of page 260. We pray that in humility, we would receive all our physical blessings with thanksgiving. Notice Psalm 106.1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So we pray every day in thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this. Thank you for my family. Thank you for uh, my job, my friends. Uh, thank you for giving me that bowl of frosted flakes this morning. Whatever it is, we, we give thanks and we continually give thanks. And as we do that, it changes our mindset from thinking solely focused on ourselves as providers and really, again, it focuses our minds on God who provides for us all things. Look, if you will, then, pardon me, on page 261, letter C, right? Again, we pray that in humility, we would find contentment with what we have received. First Timothy 6, 8, if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. That idea of contentment is interesting. Right? There's nothing wrong with enjoying uh, the blessings that God gives us. Right? And some people have more physical um, or more material 
blessings. Uh, somebody makes more at their job than others do. But really, if you think about it, what are the basic needs that you have? Food, clothing, shelter, air, water. If those five basic things are taken care of, do you really need any more? I mean, in, for instance, do you need a TV? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a TV. I like to watch movies and watch different things. Uh, but what happens is we go from the having a TV. Well, that TV is not good enough. Now I need that 128 inch TV, right? I need the biggest possible one that I can get. Do you actually need that or just is that a desire, right? I mean, again, it's kind of cool to be able to see the, the football player's head that's the same size as your body. Although, do you really need something so big that you can count the nose hairs in the actor's face? Mm. Right. So we need to focus on the basics that are provided for us and be content. Now, again, if the Lord provides extra for us, thanks be to God. But it's that extra that we then use to return to God in thanksgiving for what he gives to us, whether it's giving it an offering to the church or helping out our neighbor who is in need, um, donating it to various causes, right? We return to our Lord uh, using those extra blessings that he gives us for the benefit of others, because we know that he will always provide for our needs. And he does that then for others through the extra means that he gives us. So he provides for that homeless person as you donate to um, the food pantry or um, the homeless shelter, right? He does that for the elderly as you provide for meals on wheels, uh, whatever it happens to be through our extra through that extra material blessings uh, that God provides for us. Uh, he encourages us to use that for the benefit of others. Look at the bottom of page 261. So then how does God, oh, I'm sorry, question 273, how does God provide for our daily bread? He makes the earth fruitful with all that we need. I know this is hard to believe, uh, especially when we have drought and we see our crops failing and we think, oh man, you know, this is the prices are going to go up and everything like that. But did you know that every year we provide more in crops, right? Whether it's um, cotton for clothing and stuff like that, or corn or wheat for food, um, beef and chicken and so forth. We provide more every year our farmers do then we can actually consume as a nation that's how well god provides for us in fact there are some areas where people are told don't plant right uh, because we're going to over provide now very often then that over provision is sold to other countries even so god makes fruitful the earth to provide all that we need <clears throat> Look at our Psalm 104, verse 14. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth fruit, food from the earth. Now, letter B here says he blesses us with the ability to work and thus enjoy the fruitfulness of the earth. So 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. Even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Boy, that would really affect people nowadays, right? Uh, but the, the impetus behind that, the, the purpose here is work is actually intended to be a blessing uh, people like to do stuff right whether it's um say you like to sew right 
Um, sewing, yeah, that's, that's work, right? If you like to make clothes. Now, there are people who do that for a living, right? They, they sew, they uh, make clothes for the benefit of others. There are people who cook and they do that for their own family and um, all of these different things. Work is not a bad thing. In fact, even before the fall, God places Adam into the garden to be steward of it, to care for it, literally to work in the garden. So before the fall, though, work was um, a good thing in, in all aspects. After the fall, of course, uh, work becomes hard and, and challenging. Uh, but think about the incredible feeling that you get after you do uh, some work, right? You're done working on the car uh, and you get that grease all over your hands. And I've done it. I've made my car work again. Or you're working with wood or some other material and you take this block of wood and, and out of that block, you create this wonderful thing. How satisfying is that? Or when you take um, some random ingredients and you make this delicious meal for the benefit of others. So work in and of itself is a good thing. And we are all called to work in different ways through our different vocations. But there are those people who choose not to work. I don't mean those who can't, right? Those who are physically or mentally unable to work, but those who choose intentionally not to work. And right? again, I'm not talking to retired people who worked for like 40 years and that sort of thing. I, they worked. But those, uh, especially young people who choose to live off of others, right? I'm just going to live off mom and dad until I'm 40 and, and I'm not going to work. I'm going to live in mom's basement playing video games, right? That kind of person uh, is not being fruitful and and living out their vocation. A person who purposely lives off government assistance, not seeking to do work, but instead simply living off of what the government provides. Again, St. Paul says that that person uh, needs to be working. Otherwise, he says, uh, in regards to the church, that person shouldn't eat, right? If you were poor, then the church would provide for your well-being. Uh, but if you couldn't provide for your well-being, that was important. But if you could work and you chose not to, you didn't get any part of the portion of the food or anything like that. So let her see then on page 262. He blesses us with earthly authorities and structures, i.e. a stable government and economy which provides settings where we can work and receive our daily bread. And right now, our economy is not so great. Uh, and depending on what your political viewpoints is, our government may or may not be incredibly stable. But our Lord does provide earthly authorities and structures to allow us to work and provide and, and to receive our daily bread for our benefits and for the benefit of others. Now, the next question, question 274, does God give me daily bread for my own needs? Now, we've been touching on this throughout this. No, God wants us to share with others in need and to include them in our daily prayers, right? So if I have extra food, extra this, extra that, it does me no good to hoard that, to hold on to it. Um, what benefit is it to me if I have a closet full of clothes that, that I never wear, right? Um, but I'm going to hold on to them, even knowing that there are others who could benefit from that. Or um, having a freezer full of food that I'm never going to eat, knowing that there are people who are hungry, right? And, and so it's important for us to recognize that our Lord gives us these things, not only for our own good, but for the good of our neighbor. And so we extend, we share the blessings of that. I saw a video one time, it was, it was fascinating. This guy was doing an experiment and he would walk up to a homeless person 
and give them a hundred dollars in twenties and then walk away and just watch what they did. And it was fascinating to see how many of those homeless people walked up to other friends they had that were homeless and said, hey man, this guy just gave me a hundred bucks. Here, let me share with you. Right now, a hundred dollars when you don't have anything, that's a lot of money. And this guy could have spent it on whatever he wanted. But what does he do with it? He goes and he shares his windfall with other people. And that is the tremendous thing that we as Christians ought to do. And really that we get to do. Because our Lord pours out his blessings on us, not for us to hoard, but to share them with those around us. So look at a couple of these um, passages here. For instance, 1 Timothy 5.8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Mm. Wow, that's, that's harsh language there. Right, what about Hebrews 13, 16? Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Again, when we share, um, not only does it benefit our neighbors, it also demonstrates our faith in God, knowing that he has already provided these things for us and that we can never outgive what God gives. So if we pour out all of our blessings that God gives us, he provides for them further. Right? Look at uh, 1 John 3, 17 and 18. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Boy, we need to hear that sometimes, don't we? Finally, question 275, if God provides for everyone in these ways, why do some lack daily bread? That is a really good question. Well, notice famine, scarcity, and need are the result of a fallen creation. Human sins such as greed, callousness, and laziness often contribute to these problems. Also in a sinful world, unjust or incompetent government and economic systems may result in or contribute to the lack of daily bread. There is indeed the greatest need to pray for all earthly authority and government. By them, most of all, God preserves for us our daily bread. Now, an example of that is kind of interesting. Back in the 90s, uh, in the country of Somalia, uh, the country was ruled by warlords, right? They didn't have a stable government or anything. It was just um, men who had gangs uh, basically supporting them, uh, and they would rule portions of the country. And so the United Nations thought that they would go in because there was a famine there, right? Most of the citizens uh, that were not connected to one of these warlords, they were dying. They were suffering from malnutrition. And, and so the United Nations thought it would be a great idea to go in and drop food there, right? To feed these people. The problem is, as soon as they did that, the warlords went in and took everything. In fact, we see that a lot when um, people go in to provide, specifically when governments go in to provide food for these uh, poorer nations. Instead of going in and properly distributing the food, you know, having their soldiers there to protect the people and keep these warlords away, all they did was drop the food there and then took off. So what good does that do then if there is not a governmental structure to ensure a fair distribution of these resources? Now, it's interesting that in the church, in the history of the church, the church itself was that particular arm that distributed everything. See, in the early years of the church, the Roman government didn't really believe in charity, right? The emperor might give out bread uh, to gain favor. What good politician doesn't try and do that? But 
the church is the organization, if you will, that did take the uh, the the um, offerings, the benefits, the extras that they had, and would distribute that to the people. We see that in Acts, um, I think it's chapter six, as the deacons are called by the Jerusalem church, right? The, there's a complaint that after the meals or after the services, see, everybody would have like a big potluck and they would all bring their food in and they'd have this great big meal, but they'd set aside some bread and wine for the church service. So they'd have this meal and they'd have their church service and they'd have the Lord's uh, supper with the bread and the wine that had been brought in. And then everyone would go home and the, or the widows in particular that were there, the food would be given to them so that they could take it home and, and have food throughout the week because they didn't have any other provider for them. Well, what happened is the Jewish widows were always getting the leftovers. So the deacons were uh, appointed to ensure that both the Jewish widows and the Gentile widows would get um, an equal distribution of the goods. And so that's how the church began to provide for the well-being of the poor or the needy. And it continued to do that. So for centuries, the church had different arms, different uh, wings, if you will, departments, however you want to term it that would provide for different things. So in fact, in the history of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we used to have orphanages that would actually um, facilitate adoptions and the care of orphan children. We would, um, in the old days, our old immigration services, uh, the new one is not very good, but in the old days, uh, when immigrants would come to this country, we would provide for their well-being and help them get established. Uh, we had hospitals. You know, the Lutheran Church used to run massive hospitals with women uh, deaconesses who served as nurses to provide for both the physical and spiritual well-being of, of the people uh, as needed. Uh, we had schools. Just about every Lutheran Church had a school of some kind. Now, all of those things have been taken away from the church or we've given them up. And and the government runs all those things. And you can see how well the government, <laughs> yeah, I'll try and stay away from politics here, but you can see how those things have changed, right? So in looking here at the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread, we see how our Lord does indeed give us our daily bread, how he provides for us uh, for our every daily need and encourages us to trust that he will continue to do so even to the extent of taking what he gives us and giving it to others, sharing it with others who are in need, for it is through that that he would provide for others. All right, well done. Thank you for uh, walking with me through this. Our memory work is going to be the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer. What does this mean? And what is meant by daily bread? So that whole thing. Also, our hymn verse is Our Father Who From Heaven Above. That's hymn uh, 766 in the Lutheran Service Book, verse 5. And then your memory verse is Matthew 5, verse 45. Again, if you can, I encourage you to read over that and learn that and then say that to your parent. Remember, that's what this form is for, right? So learn your memory work and then, right? Have your parents sign that you said that to them. The reason why I do that is because your parent is actually the one who needs to be teaching you this, which is also why I encourage you, don't simply watch these videos on your own. Call mom and dad to come and sit down with you and watch through each one of these. That way, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them and hopefully they can give answer. Or if they have any questions, they can ask you and hopefully you can answer them. All right, so the next video, we're going to be looking at the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. All right.
Until the next video, I pray you have a blessed and wonderful day. Bye-bye.